um, that will use your observational abilities. I'm going to show some video tape of some different babies with their parents. Quite evocative video clips with the hope that it will stir your thoughts and associations and feelings and we'll talk about what you observed. Um, I'm not even going to really tell you about infant observation <coughs> yet um, or what, what really to look for or what to expect when you see the videotapes just so that you don't have any preconceived notions to begin with. You're just going to see what you see, hear what you hear, feel what you feel, and if you're comfortable sharing with us what you noticed, that would be wonderful. Um, there's no right answer, there's no right thing to see, and um, just to be kind of in an open, receptive state as you watch, and then we'll talk. I need one volunteer to turn off the lights and back on again when we're ready. Just one of those switches, I think, should do it all. Let's see. So I'm going to just cue up the next um, clip while you just 
sort of let in what you observed and felt and thought, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. Clients, for those of you that are seeing clients or will be seeing clients at some point. Um, and so the infant observation training, which I'll go into later, um, really is a way to become attuned to these minute experiences that a baby goes through that is very much like the minute experiences that we as adults go through and our clients go through but are often not noticed, um, not seen, not heard, and not interacted with, not related to. And it leaves the baby that's in the adult, like what you're describing, just left to bear alone some of these kinds of emotional experiences or disruptions. Um, there's a quote that just came to mind I think I'll read to you before we go to the next clip. I, I imagine some of you, I don't know where you all are in your training, but probably most or some of you have heard of Bion, the famous Bion psychoanalyst. Bion introduced the importance of what he called catastrophic change. Any new thought is felt by the psyche as potentially disruptive and shattering. Any new thought. The ability to tolerate this upheaval will result in growth, but it is a painful process that is dependent on the individual's capacity to withstand fragmentation, anxiety, and doubt. The sense of catastrophe seems to start when the infant first screams. So we're going to go on to our next clip here. Don't turn the lights out yet. Turning the sound off for a moment. Is the baby still crying? No, no crying yet. But there's music which is distracting, so I'm just tuning that out. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I think he set up the camera and then went about his <laughs> experience. And they set some music to it after it was done. That was what I tuned out. Was this sort of like a, a family video or part of a infant I don't know. I actually don't know them. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have more information about it wasn't an infant observation, though, yeah. except that we're observing. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Any thoughts or reactions? There seemed to be, and maybe because we were all laughing too, mm -hmm. but it seemed playful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there seemed to be. On his part. And, and her the baby, too. Yeah. I mean, she was. Maybe sleeping in the beginning, but she was awake for the the end, and it just seemed like I don't know. Some of these mm -hmm. But both stating their needs. Yes, really. playing with needs. Yes. she was sleeping, she continued to get more and more on top of him, as yeah. like she knew that he wanted to mm -hmm. get up. Like, and I think that's how it felt playful, because it feels so mysterious. Yeah. But, but it looked like she was sleeping. Yeah. It was hard to tell. At times it looked like her eyes were maybe a little bit open, mm -hmm. but sometimes that babies sleep with their eyes partly open, so it's hard to know how awake or asleep she was. But she knew what she wanted. Yeah. Like she knew that he wanted to leave her. Uh huh. Yes. And so it was kind and of he like, did. Yeah. <laughs> and that she was aware of it, and mm -hmm. so she kept moving on in a way that that was impossible. Yeah. So that was just amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. That she was really skillful in mm -hmm. how she did it. Mm -hmm. Like she really knew like where she needed to move <laughs> yeah. to prevent him from. Keep him from moving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I felt she also she wanted to be able to get his heartbeat. Uh -huh. heartbeat, yes, so. she was really seemed yeah. like yeah. she had her ear to his Which heart. Which they say that that in utero infants are very yes. attuned to the mother's heartbeat. Yeah, I noticed that um, as a parent, I kept having this sort of divided feeling. Like she would snuggle closer, I would feel this like, oh yeah, cuddle her up. Mm -hmm. And then when I would sometimes see his face, I could feel a lot of empathy. Like mm -hmm. right, how many nights? I was kind of connecting to the, the trapped feeling yeah. that he had. 
and thinking about actually a client that was talked about in a supervision, supervision session today where um, the client had just really latched on to the therapist and really could not let go with talking, with her gaze, with just a, a kind of emanating level of need and the therapist, you know, just kind of um, held hostage by that, really, not being able to move and be free. And I, maybe because that was on my mind, I was very aware of his feeling of entrapment. When I, yeah. when I had a newborn, after a couple of weeks, I remember I had the strangest feeling, which I'd never felt before in my entire life, which is that I wanted to run. Huh. I hate exercise. I never want to move my ass. But after like a couple of weeks of the baby constantly on the mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I think I'd like to run a marathon. It was some kind of strange experience. Uh -huh. <laughs> what did you think? What did you make of that? I was kind of delighted with myself. Like, oh, wow. Never before. Mm. And probably never again. Uh -huh. I want to run. <laughs> I was wondering at first if um, father's discomfort was just because he was in a very uncomfortable position in a very tiny space, uh -huh. and then he was, you know, that that was maybe just part of it because he just seemed like he didn't quite know how to maintain an attuned allowance uh -huh. Uh -huh. for her to just be yeah. the way she wanted to be. Yes. Yeah, I had a fantasy that he had other things he wanted to do. Yeah. yeah. You know, sort of hard to be in that timeless space with a baby and let go of some of those things. His facial expressions were so... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of comical. <laughs> There's no otherness, really, at that point. It's just yeah. me and my needs. I want this warmth and cuddly experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I thought I, um, I might have heard it wrong, but it sounded like in the very beginning, um, the baby was actually calling out for mommy. I heard that too, yeah. yeah. Which, I don't know, maybe, and this is interesting, coming off of what you just said, mm -hmm. there might be, I mean, there's this, like, still somewhat distinction of, like, mom and dad. Yeah. So there is this, like, um, I don't know how that plays out. I'm kind of thinking out loud now, but, like, mm -hmm. um, not other, but there's obviously difference. Yes. Like, being able to differentiate between. Um, Mommy and daddy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you know how old she is? I don't. She was there. What was your guess? Well, she's able to stand. Mm -hmm. So I was probably <coughs> upwards of six or seven months. Probably a little older, I, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. But. Yeah. 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 Another one or two, or we could go on to talk about working with infant states and adults and about infant observation. Any strong feeling towards one direction or another? I'm open. I feel like talking to say what? Maybe just one more. One more. Okay. okay. Good. It's blurry, for one, um, and there's a line going through it that <clears throat> probably
problematic, but I think you'll still be able to see. Sorry, there's not going to be sound because there's somebody talking, so we're just going to watch in silence. Brian Feldman, by the way, who's someone that, that does infant observation. Here's one more on this clip. That's the father's finger. It's on the cheek. My just immediate reaction was similar to that first clip of like how once again like um, dependent the baby is in that first part like mm -hmm. the mother had to hold its head up and mm -hmm. um, and like orient the baby to her breast and just like how dependent the baby is just mm -hmm. for like the most basic of survival needs yeah. really about that. Mm -hmm. Me, the, I've never breastfed a baby, but the angle looks very forced. It was. And it was a little disturbing. Yes. It was the second part more serene. Yeah. What, what felt, did you say serene? The second part felt more serene. Yeah. More like the baby was in control, whereas the first part it felt like the yes. mother was like, you could almost feel his face pushing. Yes. <laughs> yes. And she was pushing. Yes. Yeah. It just felt so. Mm -hmm. Did anyone have any sort of somatic or emotional reactions to that? Yeah. What What did you feel? Part of what I felt was that you know, the way she was using fingers uh -huh. to, instead of like the support of the whole hand. Yeah. Uh, and the baby seemed just kind of unsettled and unhappy with that, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. un unable to show it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And even in the second part, where you know the angle was better, mm -hmm. um, it was all that yeah. that you're cooing. So I think the baby's almost kind of um, withdrawn or dissociated. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the fingers, all the like the fingers were disturbing me in both, like yeah. her finger and and then the dad's finger. I felt really tense and kind of like get that out of there. Yeah, <laughs> like an intrusion. Yeah, Too much. yeah, yeah. So maybe the father was 
having a reaction to what he was witnessing. <laughs> Maybe envy, anxiety, feeling left out, something like that. Yeah, it wasn't a caress of, of the baby's no, cheek. Not at like all. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. It felt slightly aggressive. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. And then the other one, she like used her finger to like open the baby's mouth or yeah. do something. Mm -hmm. I just didn't, I don't know, I didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> when I watched that first one where the baby's facing the mother's breast, I often get this kind of suffocated feeling, like just imagining, you know, my whole face pushed in like that, it would be really hard to breathe, it seems. And that might make me anxious and not able to relax and take in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just when you say that, I'm getting this kind of this colicky response in my stomach. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I just felt my chest tight. Just tight right up. Tighten up, yeah. yeah. move on. Um, so I have um, some text on slides as a way to kind of get some of the information to you that I want to get to you, but feel free to interrupt me at any point, ask questions or make comments about the material. It really doesn't have to be um, even in sequence, or we don't have to get to everything. Um, I wanted to read you one more thing before we get to the slides. This is um, a book that I use a lot of the time. It's called Becoming a Person Through Psychoanalysis, and it's by Neville Symington. I highly recommend it. It's a very accessible book. Um, he's a British analyst who lives and practices in Australia. And um, there are several chapters in here that I have found myself reading over and over and over again through the years of my practice. Um, and this one passage is um, from a chapter called The Patient Makes the Analyst. So um, he was working, he, I think he at this point had already gone through his psychoanalytic training um, and he was working with a woman who was very psychotic and he didn't have a clue really how to work with her or help her and um, he was really stumbling about much of the time because she would come into session and just say one word for the entire hour and he would make all kinds of interpretations about that one word, thinking, you know, how brilliant to, you know, understand that one word and what she was really trying to say. But at some point, she became so frustrated with him that she was just railing against him session after session after session. And this is a passage that's in that moment of time in their work. She had been castigating me session after session, week after week, month after month, and I had been busy defending myself against attack and pointing out her destructiveness. She went to a country town and spoke to her previous therapist, confiding her anxiety about the way the analysis was going with me. She told me what this woman had said to her, and this is in quotes, he can't hear the crying baby. When she said this, it struck a chord which went right through me. <clears throat> I suddenly heard the session after session, week after week, month after month, in a different light. I heard a desperately crying baby. <clears throat> I was thunderstruck. I said to her, what she told you is entirely correct and she burst into tears. So, one of the 
aspects of the art of psychotherapy and of working with infantile states is being able to hear the communication, the unconscious usually, communication from the infant and the adult. And sometimes we can't hear it if the adult is screaming at us. We can't hear the baby crying because we're hearing the adult yelling and castigating and criticizing. But the work is to, to go deeper than what we're hearing from the adult and see if we can really hear and understand and see that there's an infant in the adult that needs to be understood as well. So with that, um, the focus of my work and the work that I like to teach about has to do with bringing to life the link between infantile experiences and developmental work with adults in psychotherapy. <clears throat> Working with pre-verbal, pre-cognitive infantile states in psychotherapy helps the client integrate previously unknown and disowned aspects of the self. Unconscious conflicts, needs, desires, and feelings become more accessible as a result. So we're talking really about the age range, the, the stage of development from birth to about two years old, so before there's language really when um, the baby's communicating through movements and cries and looks and other ways that babies communicate. And that those are also ways that our adult clients communicate with us, but we may not be hearing or seeing those because they're much more unconscious forms of communication. They may come through behavior, uh, sometimes what's called enactments, or acting out on the part of the client. Um, it can come through some of the things that they're saying, if we listen more deeply to what's being communicated, sometimes through the transference. Sometimes our counter-transference experiences are the ways that we tune into the baby experience. Sometimes we feel, as the therapist, kind of infantile or needy or regressed, which could tune us into the fact that we're encountering that part in, in the adult client as well. Again, stop me anytime if you want to ask or talk about any of this. This therapeutic work with infantile states helps heal the earliest wounds and traumas that are deeply buried and therefore not easily accessible because they occurred during the preverbal, precognitive stage of development. Oftentimes, these earliest wounds and traumas are not things that are remembered in the way that we remember other things from earlier on. They're, they're more often lodged in the body, like somatic kind of experiences or um, emotions or conflicts that we don't really understand. Is that implicit memory rather than explicit memory? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. The absence of an ongoing experience of being emotionally held and contained safely and securely in a parent's psyche and arms can elicit in an infant the most primitive forms of anxiety. I think that's some of what we're, we were just talking about. Through the mysterious activity of the parent's reverie, a state of receptivity, attentiveness, and connection, the infant's split-off anxieties are contained, detoxified, and returned to the infant, but now in a modified form that the baby can, can bear. When you said reverie there, that's a non-term? It is. Beyond, and then Ogden, Tom Ogden, talks a lot about reverie, yeah. Unthinkable anxiety, a Winnicott term, and nameless dread, a Beyond term, have, through the parent's reverie, become bearable. Similarly, this is the healing process that can take place in psychotherapy when working with the infant and the adult. The presence of a parent therapist with a good enough containing function 
supports the development of creative thinking, the capacity to bear painful emotional states, and increases relational qualities in the infant client. So now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the infant observation process. Um, infant observation was started in the 1940s in London by a psychoanalyst named Esther Bick, who actually was the patient of Melanie Klein. Um, that's just a little piece of gossip <laughs> people like to pass around. Um, excuse me. And she created this, um, what she considered a training method. Infant observation is a training method, which she um, formed in order to train preclinical students before they would be starting to see clients as a way to help them build certain qualities. Um, let's see if I had my flyer, I could repeat all the different qualities I inhabit right here. But it was on the flyer, um, all those wonderful qualities and skills that you can build like receptivity, um, building a sense of containment, uh, working with one's own counter-transference reactions uh, without acting on them, um, being able to tune into minute details in a client's experience as well as their movements, their emotional expressions. Um, so here's, here's what infant observation is about. Infant observations take place in the baby's home soon after birth. The observer observes the baby and family each week for one hour for two years or longer. I just completed a two-year observation last week. The observer does not do anything to take care of the baby. Instead, the observer witnesses as much as is possible, saying very little, responding to but not initiating any interaction, either with the baby or the parents or anyone else that's there. This allows her, him, to notice and receive as much information as possible, consciously and unconsciously. After each observation, the observer writes a narrative of all that was observed. Then, in a weekly supervised infant observation seminar group, the written observations are read and discussed. These discussions include explorations of the observers and group members' associations and counter-transference reactions to the observation. So that's, you got a little flavor of what we do, um, which was we observed, it wasn't a live baby and family, but, but you tuned in to a baby and a parent. Aww. <laughs> so little. How old? Six weeks. Oh my Aww. goodness. <laughs> what a treat. <laughs> she just needed our attention. <laughs> um, so, uh, what was I saying? So, we watched some of the tapes, tuned into the baby and the baby's parent or situation, um, and then tried to tune into our own experience which is what we do in the observation. So we try to stay tuned into ourselves as well as what we're seeing. We leave the observation and write down everything we can remember that we saw and heard. And then we go to the weekly observation group where we read the observation and discuss our reactions to what was seen and heard and felt. And. Um, During the course of an infant observation, an observer witnesses the very earliest and therefore most primitive forms of human expression and protection. The observer sees the reactions, protective mechanisms, and behavior patterns babies need to survive in their helpless, dependent, and almost skinless state like an astronaut who has been shot out into outer space without a space suit. Quote from Esther Bick. Just imagine that. 
being in outer space without a spacesuit. Mm -hmm. The observer closely watches over and over from the very beginning of life the baby's passage through terror, disintegration, reintegration, and containment. This process frequently evokes an experience of the infant self within <laughs> the observer. <clears throat> and that is part of the training, is that the only way we're going to be able to help our adult clients with the infant in them is that we have to have worked with the infant in ourselves. We have to have become familiar with our own infantile and really primitive states and be comfortable enough with them to be able to receive the communications from the infant in our adult patients. Um, I was just going to say something about the terror in that one, um, this one passage, the terror, disintegration, reintegration, and containment, which you can see, those of you who've watched newborn babies, the, the, the shaking and the trembling just when you take their clothes off. Um, that kind of almost panic of not having much of a skin yet. And there are moments when we're working really deeply with clients where we can see that kind of state in the client. A, a kind of terror, a kind of trembling. Um, panic. So, carrying on. Infant observation also sensitizes the observer to the infant within the observed infant's parents. So mm. when we're observing a baby, we're also actually observing the baby in the infant's parents. And you'll often see the baby, just like that father that was doing that. <coughs> The infant in him was getting upset. He may have wanted the holding and the nursing and the attention. Without being obligated to do anything about what is being seen and felt, an indelible emotional impression is left in the observer's psyche of these infantile states and object relations. This is a true learning from emotional experience, a beyond term learning from experience, which is then translated into a profound and insightful capacity to understand and bear disturbing primitive emotional and somatic expressions and protections in the infant self of the observer's clients. <clears throat> we as psychotherapists have to be able to bear and work with infantile states in ourselves to be able to recognize and work with them in our clients. In the infant observation process, the observer tries to see what there is to be seen in the baby's experience, letting go of preconceptions and theories. This is a necessary skill in the work of in-depth psychotherapy. <clears throat> so it's the idea that we let go of what we think people should be working on or what they should be expressing or how they should be progressing in their lives, um, and any theories we may have about um, any of those things. And to really be with someone and receive who they are and really come to know what kind of healing they need, we do have to let go of those kinds of things. The infant observation process is a really deep way of experiencing that. One. One thing that I find so amazing about the process is it's not in my office where I have all my things, it's my space, people come to see me. I feel somewhat protected by being in my own office, in my own space, and for the observations, you go to somebody's home, you have no idea what you're going to be encountering. So, thoughts, or I don't know if there's much more. Oh, here, we could talk about this. I think this is the last one. <clears throat> These are just some examples of infantile states, but there are many, many more. I just sort of free-associated and, and jotted some down. 
um, overwhelming experiences of emotional pain, sense of omnipotence, the belief or feeling of being able to control the world and everybody in it, lack of self-awareness, weak boundaries, in other words, being in a state of merger uh, much of the time or some of the time, impulsiveness and a lack of containment, avoidance of inner or outer conflict, powerful, a powerful conflict between one's needs and a sense of danger in satisfying those needs, reactivity to changes and to differences. That's it. Okay, so let's talk about any question. Um, well, it's not so much that they're chosen. It's actually hard to find families who want to be observed. In, in uh, This is um, a training method that is used um, throughout Europe and South America. Um, there are even places in Africa that are using this training method. For some reason in the United States, it's quite rare. There, there aren't that many um, infant observation groups and teachers in the U.S. as compared to other countries. Um, so, for instance, in London, it's quite easy to find families who want to be observed. I think there's just a sense of being used to this sort of thing um, there, but here it is not. And so it's quite difficult to find a family. Um, we, we in the observation community have theories about why people volunteer to be observed. It seems like often um, it's because there's been some sense of loss in the mother or the primary caretaker parent. Some kind of loss in that person's past that makes the person long for someone to be there as a witness. Um, Sometimes there are other things that the person clearly states as their reason why, like they might have an idea that they're going to get help understanding child development, which is not why we're there, um, or help diapering the baby and feeding the baby and taking the baby for walks, which is also not why we're there, and eventually they find that out, and some are quite angry, even though it's quite clear from the very beginning what you know, what we're about and what we're doing there. Um, there's a level of need in the parents that just can't, can't quite believe that someone would just be there to watch. So, does that help answer your question? Yeah, I also just wondered if you're only there for like an hour, an hour a week. One hour a week. Um, wouldn't it very often the parents be on very good behavior? That is always taken into account that there's some performative quality that can be there. But, you know, over time there is a kind of relaxing in the parent, parents that goes on. Um, also sometimes, you know, a parent can't control what's happening. A baby starts to have a breakdown and the parent starts to just have to respond in a very, the most real way that they have to respond to that, which may be a deficient way, but that is the way they have to respond, and they can no longer, you know, be a performer. It's they're they're in the heat of the situation. So, but yes, that's as with any research, you know, anything that's observed is affected by the observer. If two questions about about the recruiting of families. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, um, are families recruited in affiliation with some kind of a, 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 an understanding of a psychoanalytic that it's a psychoanalytic enterprise? And, uh, if you and know, if they want to know that, that yes. But many people don't even know what that is. They don't mm -hmm. know what psychoanalysis is or psychoanalytic psychotherapy is. Some people do, some people don't. We talk about the Tavistock, which is a psychoanalytic institute. Um, this is a Tavistock model of infant observation. Um, and we do type, talk about psychotherapy. I, you know, the way I introduced myself was that I, I'm a psychotherapist wanting to learn about infants and, and child development so that I can work more deeply with 
primitive states in my adult patients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there was some positive response to that of wanting to help, help in that way mm -hmm. to, um, you know, to further um, the work of psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what's interesting about this is that, um, I mean, this happened with the family that I just observed, but it's happened with many other families as well is that they all say how incredibly valuable it is for them to be observed. That it brings a kind of um, observing ego, awareness of an observing ego in themselves that they hadn't sometimes developed yet. And um, there's a beginning of developing that through this process. Um, My, my yeah, other, you had another yeah, question. My other question was, um, in terms of the relative acceptance of this yeah. here and yeah. in Europe, um, is the psychoanalysis more broadly accepted in Europe? Than I would say, Europe? yes. <coughs> I would say. I think it's becoming more so here, but, you know, it, that was the hotbed was in Europe. The beginning of, you know, the beginnings of it started there, so... Yeah, I think people are just more used to the idea and believe in it more. Um, hmm. Yeah, the medical model hasn't taken root in the same way. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, we're running out of time. And this was really just meant to be a short introduction, but it's been wonderful to have all of your, you know, comments and questions. It's been a very nice audience. I'm sorry that we have to end. Things do end. People have to You're separate. Us. <laughs> yeah. So sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to be in contact with me, I know some of you are here to find out about practicum supervisors. I, I know that was one way that this was advertised. Um, I, I have my cards here, or you may already have a flyer with my information on it, so feel free to contact me if you want to.